Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is for the 2011 French horror film Livid, and this one's by Alexander Bustillo and Julianne Mari. Now, if those names sound familiar, it's because they worked on Inside. And there's a newer film they have out called The Deep House, which is, I believe is on Hulu at the moment when I'm reviewing this. And I'm going to plan to watch that, so I will have reviewed already, and it's on my channel right now, Inside. I'm reviewing Livid right now, and then I'm going to do The Deep House as well. Now, if people don't know, I believe it was Bustillo and Maori who were, for a while, attached to the new Hellraiser project. And then they ended up exiting because of, I believe, creative differences, which... That's been an ongoing saga with that whole situation. So just in case, you know, you've been like, I've heard those names thrown around many times before. So Livid is a film I've been wanting to get to because uh, I heard good things about it way back when it came out and it just never really made it to availability in the United States. I even had it in my Netflix DVD queue and it was just always like pending. You know, it's one of those things where like whenever it's available and it never became available. So Glad that Shudder got it. That's where I watched it when I'm reviewing now. So once again, written by Bustillo and Maori. Uh, they also, they did Inside, Among the Living. Uh, they did a portion of the ABCs of Death, the second one. The film Candisha, which I also have a review for on my channel, and I think is still on Shudder. And then The Deep House, like I said. Uh, this was originally supposed to be an English language film shot in the UK, but they moved to a lower budget production in France because they started to lose creative control to the UK studio they were starting to work with. So I love hearing these types of stories because that says that for the filmmakers, it's about the creativity. It's not about the big budget and trying to, you know, get a bigger, wider release. It's about trying to make a good product. So I really, really like to hear those types of things. I mean, it sucks that the relationship wasn't working out with that first studio, but the judgment of Bustillo and Maori uh, speaks volumes, I think. Supposedly, an American remake is in the works. Could be good. This is an interesting concept, and I did enjoy this film significantly more than I enjoyed Inside. I enjoyed some things about Inside, but I like this one more. Uh, this one's more, um, I don't know, there's a lot more unique, interesting things going on in this. I would say that the the story seems kind of underdeveloped but it's still very engaging and interesting and at an hour and a half it actually moves relatively well and quickly um wow what a start with the beautiful beach and grotesque rotten portion of a face in seaweed uh and that points to something this, this is a be beautifully shot film it looks amazing cinematography directing wonderful the acting's quite well done the music oh my goodness i love the score for this film outstanding score for this film but the way they start it in the beginning they're showing so much beauty they're showing like this nice relaxing beautiful beach and then they pan to the seaweed that has a portion of this just rotted face in it now i'm assuming that that is one of the faces like that's a remnant of one of these kids that mrs wilson had been kidnapping and draining blood from that's my assumption because they don't circle back to that at any point in the film to explain it so that's just my assumption on it but if people had other ideas on what that is go ahead and put it in the comments like i said outstanding music out of the gate you like how they start the music in this film from the get-go you understand this is going to be a really good score and it's a phenomenal score i don't always comment on the music because a lot of the times it's just kind of serviceable in this case it really stands out as being particularly awesome and i think that's good because it kind of enhances the aspect of the ballerina in this which i actually don't even really think is all that important for the story that's one of the things i think is very underdeveloped in the story is the whole ballerina aspect and uh, Jezel being um, being the head of this ballerina studio, in essence. I mean, it's it's in there, and they do a little bit with it, but I think it should have been developed a lot more, in my opinion. Seeing that Lucy has different colored eyes, which are focused on in the beginning of the film, makes me believe that there's a duality to the character. Immediately when I saw these two different colored eyes, they focus right on it. I'm like, this is signaling duality within that character, whether it means... I was thinking maybe it would mean that she had a spirit of something else inside of her, which actually ends up happening later, obviously, or she had some sort of like split personality situation. 
uh, because they focus on it so much. And then they further have the conversation when she gets in the car with Mrs. Wilson about what it means to have two different, two different colored eyes. And Mrs. Wilson basically says something to the degree of the duality within people. Now, once you see the reveal at towards the end of the film, you know that it's really just kind of signaling to people that another soul will end up being in her body, which is what happens when there's the transfer ritual that Jezel does from the soul of Lucy to Anna's body and the soul of Anna to Lucy's body to kind of restore her to health as her daughter. Uh, but I did think that that conversation in the car was kind of too over the top, in my opinion. I think it was leading the audience a little bit too much, like give the audience a little more credit and let them just see where things go. And then they would realize like, that's what the two different colored eyes mean. And I'm sure a lot of people even suspected something with the two different colored eyes from a duality standpoint. So you really don't need to call that out in the actual film. So I, I just didn't like that aspect of it, but that's, you know, that's a small thing. So when they first start going around uh, Mrs. Wilson and Lucy to the elderly folks to, to try and help them out, uh, Mr. Marshall is the first, and his existence seems extremely, extremely lonely. Uh, it's a quick introduction to him, but they do a really good job of just establishing how lonely and how sad his his existence kind of is. And then they go to the second person, and it seems very much the same. And then they go to Jezel, which I'm glad they didn't go to more people before getting to Jezel, because I felt like three was the right amount to like get the point of it. And I think this was kind of pointing to a it, an idea that society kind of discards people once they get much older. They just become kind of forgotten. You know, they're thrown aside and they're forgotten, and that's kind of what is being shown with these people as they're going to try and help them. It's just this very lonely, sad existence where they're obviously not engaged in society anymore, and it seems that society doesn't care about them, and they've been very much forgotten. And for Jessel, that actually ends up being a good thing, obviously, because then she can kind of operate in secrecy. Lucy really can't just follow simple directions. She was told to wait in the car, by Mrs. Wilson when they go to Jessel's house and she just doesn't like it it was like almost no time she sits there for like seconds and then she's just like I'm gonna get out and explore like okay I understand they need to do that for the film but she can't follow instructions uh Jessel's house looks appropriately creepy messy and dark so they did a really good job with the actual set design of this film a lot of very creepy, dark, um, scary-looking things within the house. And I love kind of all the mechanized stuff that they end up throwing into the film as well. Especially, like, that tea party with, like, the taxidermied heads. Like, the taxidermy, taxidermied animal parts, mainly the heads, like, on these doll bodies at the tea party. And they're, like, automated to, like, actually move from time to time. Very creepy, very well done. But overall, great set design, great atmosphere as well. The scene of Mrs. Wilson driving up next to the girl on the bike and then it does a freeze frame is odd. It definitely gives the idea that Mrs. Wilson is sinister and obviously that's what ends up happening because we get that cut scene later on where it's showing that she's uh, draining the blood of this individual in her bathtub. Now obviously we know later on that that's because she's doing this for Jessel because when Lucy and her visit Jessel... Uh, Lucy points out that she's, you know, getting transfusions, and that's obviously because she's some sort of vampire. This is kind of like a somewhat vampirism film. Um, it's not straightforward vampire. It doesn't, you know, go by all the rules of vampirism. Uh, it kind of does its own thing, which is one of the, the things I like about this film, one of the reasons I say it's kind of more unique. But it also is very much like a fairy tale. And I believe that's kind of what the intention was, is tr kind of trying to be like a throwback to like the really old original like German Grimm's fairy tales, which were really dark and really messed up, to be honest. So this kind of feels like a new entry into something like that. The Slaughtered Lamb, they go to the Slaughtered Lamb for a drink, uh, Lucy and, Will, and her boyfriend Will do. Uh, definitely, this is a reference to the pub in American Werewolf in London. There are a few other kind of moments that I'll talk about that were nods to other horror films. 
As soon as the wealth of Miss Jezel is brought up, uh, you just know that Lucy and William will end up breaking in to try and find it. Uh, we all see that coming. You know, we, we all could just feel that that's where the film was going. But at the same time, the characters aren't great. You know, there's not a whole lot of development with Will and Lucy. There's certainly not much with Will. Like, Will just shows up and he's just like a piece of crap, basically. Like, there's no depth to him. He's paper thin. And this is kind of the issues that, one of the issues I saw in the film inside when I, I reviewed it is like one-dimensional characters. Uh, Lucy, they tried to do a little bit with her with the whole, you know, backstory of her mother committing suicide and then her father moving on so quickly and her being upset about that. But her motivations seem weird. Like, literally... The situation where she goes home and she becomes upset because her father is talking about having this new woman move in and be a part of her life when she doesn't want her. Like, that's what triggers her to go ahead and say yes to Will to burglarize Jezel's house. Like, those things don't correlate. Like, that... In what world does a person, like, get upset about this at home and is like, yes, let's go steal from someone. Like, it's... I guess it's supposed to be this kind of like she's being traumatized as a child, like then she starts acting out. I don't know, but it just feels weird. It doesn't seem like it fits, and and it just feels like a real jump in personality, honestly. Um, where is the stuff with Miss Wilson going? When you see the bathtub scene where she's draining the blood, like at that point you're just like, okay, she's bad. And immediately I started thinking, like they showed all those missing signs, missing posters. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm pretty sure that she is the one who's been doing this to all these kids. But how does she fit into the grand scheme here? Obviously, we find out later she was another daughter of Jessel, and she was helping Jessel. She's kind of, it's kind of like she was the Renfro to her. Just saying. Nice to see Beatrice Dale as Lucy's deceased mother in this. Obviously, if you've seen Inside, you would recognize her. She was the the lady like she literally had no character name in inside she was the insane lady who tries to cut the child out of the woman yeah well successfully does but so lucy's father having a new woman move in is what pushes lucy to say yes to burglarizing the home of an old woman in a coma if that sounds bad it is that exemplifies why i'm saying it's such a leap for her to be like okay this is now we should do this i just don't get it um Another reference, real quick, to another uh, horror film. Season 3, or uh, Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, making an appearance when they are, because it's on October 31st, Halloween. So they're in the car, and then you see these three kids with the masks on, the witch, the pumpkin, and the skeleton, obviously look exactly like Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. So another cool nod to another cool horror film. As soon as the part with the green flame happens and Ben comments on Will-o'-the-Wisp, he calls it a Will-o'-the-Wisp, I immediately thought this is a modern fairy tale. It has to be because in what story setting do they reference something like a Will-o'-the-Wisp? That immediately connected in my head and I'm like, ah, this is supposed to be a fairy tale most likely. Because that's the first kind of like supernatural type thing that ends up happening in the film. Up until then, you're just like, oh, we could be dealing with, like, real-life situation type stuff here. And that ends up not being the, the case, obviously. The Will of the Wisp thing is where everything's triggered, where, where the audience kind of understands things are going to be weird now. Um, so, yeah, and I thought that really signaled that it's a fairy tale. So, Lucy draws the line at breaking things, but not stealing money from an old woman in a coma. Again, the character writing, not the greatest. She doesn't make sense. She does not make sense as a character. The other thing is, because of the way she acts and because of the way Will acts and because of the fact that Ben is just there, you don't really care that much about these characters. At least I didn't. I cared a little bit about Lucy because she's kind of trying to help things out here. But like Will didn't care at all when he got off to Ben. Couldn't care less. I mean, he seemed like maybe he was a decent guy, but also he was just going along with everything, and he was, like, barely there as a character. So I was just like, I don't know. When taxidermy ends up being talked about, it gives the idea that there will be a deeper tie, tie to it later in the film. Obviously, there is, and that leads up to the creepy taxidermy tea party, which I love that scene uh, for its creepiness. Um, 
But yeah, the taxidermy ends up being more significant because of what Jessel was doing to Anna, basically doing some taxidermy-esque stuff to her. I guess the biggest thing that they show is when she kind of puts the mechanized parts in her spine, which I assume is because she broke her spine when she was pushing her so hard uh, to be an awesome ballerina. But at the same time, like, if she's some sort of vampire type thing, like, does she actually have bones break and they stay broken? I mean, I guess so in their version. So that was kind of interesting. Um, and I, I like how it's kind of this premise of vampirism but they kind of have their own rules because then it, it it makes sure that the audience is guessing a little bit more. They can't just be like, oh, okay, it's vampires. So we know that, you know, they can't go out in the sun. They're, they don't like garlic. They can be staked in the heart. Like it throws the rules out. So it's like, okay, it's vampirism, but they have their own rules. So let's find out what they are as the film goes. Great use of Jessel's breathing apparatus to build tension when they get to, uh, get to uh, her room to try and take the key off her neck. That was awesome. It's like pretty silent and just the sound of her breathing apparatus. Very creepy, builds wonderful atmosphere, very tension building. And that's one of the other things is the sound design in this film is quite good too. So a lot of really awesome technical aspects to this film. I just think that some of the story elements should have and could have been kind of fleshed out better. Pretty fun scene when Ben gets murdered by the three ballerinas. It does kind of happen like out of nowhere. You didn't see three ballerinas jumping out and murdering someone coming. So that's cool. I like that. And it just looks good. It looks brutal. It looks uh, creepy. It's, yeah, well shot. So Aunt Anna's a vampire, I guess? I was kind of let down by that aspect at first because I was like, oh no, she's a vampire. Because I was assuming at that point, okay, we're playing by the same rules as vampires most likely. But then I realized as it continued to go, oh, we're not. Okay, so that's when I started feeling better. Disappointed at first, then I realized not the same rules. I'm okay with it. Will's reaction to Ben being dead insanely subdued especially with the fact that this is his brother he literally just like like you can tell he's kind of like what's going on but he like calmly walks up to him as he's got a blood-soaked bag over his head and is just not moving and then takes it off and sees his throat's been slit and he's dead but standing up and doesn't really have much of a reaction to it Another character issue within this film. I, I just don't understand it. I was like, I don't know. I felt nothing when Will was killed. Just going to reiterate that one. I was like, okay, fine, check. He's out of here. Because we all knew he was going to die. He was the main person doing the bad stuff. All the flashbacks to Anna being a ballerina didn't feel like they fit with the film. The whole ballerina aspect in general feels like it's for no reason. I mean... Yes, I, I will disagree with my own, with my own note to a degree, because there was a reason. Like that was the whole setup for the relationship between Jessel and Anna, and obviously it looks like what it is is this whole thing about um, adults kind of preying on the youth of the young, and in that case, you know, Jessel is a vampire of sorts, so she's preying on the youth by a having their blood even during the current events of, of the film. And in the past, she was preying on them from the aspect of trying to live through them by trying to break them and make them become this amazing ballerina that would be in her own image, basically. So she's stealing their life in that essence and pushing them so hard as ballerinas and literally breaking them at times, like she does on a spine. And then much later on in life, she's still taking the, the literal life blood from the young as Mrs. Wilson, you know, collects that for her and gives her transfusions. I figured Mrs. Wilson was involved, hence her being heard talking to Miss Jessel earlier on. There is that thing that Lucy says when she enters the room and she first sees Jessel where she's like, why were you talking to her if she's in a coma? And she was just like, oh, I just tell her my problems. I figure she's the only person who will listen and not judge me in essence. And, like, you get, like, at the moment, it kind of explains that away. But then you think back once you find out that Wilson is involved. And you're like, oh, she, like, was legitimately talking to her. And, and Jessel is not in a coma at that point, really. 
So the moth from the book that Lucy opened contain Anna's soul. And once Jessel does her ritual with Lucy, her soul switches bodies with Anna. So, yeah. But the thing that obviously Jessel didn't count on is the fact that Anna doesn't like Jessel. And Anna is interested in getting revenge. So when, when she's in Lucy's body, she does take revenge with, I believe it was the scissors. She takes out Wilson. She takes out Jessel. And then she saves Anna to a degree. And then I think it's supposed to be this kind of like kind of happy-ish ending because Anna gets to live an actual life which she did not have before because of A, her vampirism and B, how hard her mother was pushing her to be this ballerina and just like kept her in the house and B, it's supposed to be happy because um, Lucy gets to go be with her mother in heaven. Now, although I hated that ending, I hated the way they shot it and like showing Anna's body, who's Lucy inside her body, like floating up into the sky and like the, the bright light, like it's so cliche, it's so idiotic, like I just hated that. Like them going to the beach, fine, but once you hit that moment of her body starting to like go up, I was like, oh geez, come on now. We could have done much better on this one. Nice head-ripping death for Jessel, by the way. I love, love, love. That's probably, other than the taxidermy tea party, probably my favorite scene where they, like, each grab the bottom jaw and the top jaw and, like, just rip the head apart. Looked outstanding. Very awesome practical effects. Um, the practical effects on Ben getting his throat slit were, were solid, pretty good. But then the Jessel thing, I was just like, that's what I was looking for. Especially after all they did in the film inside. Like, those practical effects were really good, and that was even lower budget of a film. So, yeah. Very cool visual of the house floating in the dark. That was awesome. And I did like that kind of reveal because it, she had said to Anna before in these flashbacks, you know, don't try running away at night. You can't get away. And you just think that, you know, she'll catch her or something like that. She'll keep her locked in. Like, she's just not going to be able to get away. And then you realize that, like, literally at night... The whole house and a bunch of the ground underneath it is, like, floating. I don't know. Is it in the sky? Is it in this kind of, like, nether realm? I don't know. But it looked amazing. It looked cool. And it added an, another interesting kind of supernatural aspect to the film that I enjoyed. Um, I would have liked some better lighting at certain times. It wasn't terrible. But there were certain times where I was trying to see more in the scene and I couldn't. Now, part of that may have been the fact that I wasn't watching this film in, like, pitch dark. So for anyone who, you know, is going to watch the film or going to watch the film again, I probably recommend watching it when it's totally dark because then it would help you see a little bit better. But I would have liked the lighting to have been a little bit better from time to time. It is slow-paced, but the atmosphere and how it's maintained really does keep you engaged and thinking that pretty much anything could happen at any time. That's one of the important things. If you're going to go at a slow pace, maintaining that type of atmosphere where the audience kind of is on edge and feels like anything could happen at any time just kills the kills any ill effects from the slow pacing. And I like that. I think they did a nice job with that. There's a bit of a commentary on how the elderly become tossed aside and forgotten. I already talked about it at the beginning. The biggest point of this film, though, is parental control and how overbearing parents can stifle the lives of their children. Obviously, I talked about that even more in depth earlier when I was talking about how Jessel was controlling the ballerinas and sucking their lives away by not letting them have lives, by devoting everything to being a ballerina and literally destroying their bodies, and then later in life, literally taking the blood from the youth. So it just got worse. And the last thing I want to close on is the definition of the word livid. Now, it has two definitions, and they both apply in this instance. Furiously angry is one, because obviously Anna, very furiously angry with Jessel. But it also means dark bluish gray in color. Now, if people have heard the term lividity, that's something that's used for dead bodies. Um, and that's usually when the body's been laying in a certain position, so all the blood settles to the bottom, and it looks a bluish gray. That's why it's called lividity. So there's that in the film, obviously. You're seeing lividity in the film because of the death, because of actual dead bodies. And obviously Anna is basically a dead body. So yeah, a dead body come back to life. But anyway, there you go. Those are my thoughts on livid. I obviously like this a lot more than I liked inside. 
Uh, so out of five stars with half stars in play, I'm giving it a very solid three and a half star rating. I did enjoy it, but I would like to hear your opinions on this film. Go ahead and put it in the comments. Love it, hate it, in between. And don't just say love it, hate it, or in between. Just tell me a little, at least a little bit why. You know, a sentence or two, what you did or did not like about it. And we'll talk about that. Or if you just want to talk about horror in general, do it in the comments. Do me a quick favor, hit subscribe if you haven't already. If you have, thank you very much. I do appreciate that. If you haven't, that's your best way to repay me if you like this video or any video I've ever done because I'm doing this for free at this point when I'm doing it. It's a creative outlet, but I also need some motivation to keep going. And when I see new subscribers, I do get motivated legitimately. So I would really appreciate that. Also hit the notification bell button. Then you'll know when I'm putting up new videos, which I'm doing for a week at this point. So I think that's a good amount. Anyway, thank you very much for taking your time to watch this video. And until next time, keep it brutal.